Scott, thank you very much for your introduction. And, and Dean Cornia, thank you for all that you've done. John, another good friend. And, and uh, uh, where's Professor Little? Um, somewhere there, for, for your help and, and all the things that you've been, you've been doing to build up the, uh, the, the uh, Rollins Center. We, we're just honored to be a part of it. Um, I want to spend just a little bit of time telling you a couple of things tonight that might be a little out of, uh, uh, out of the norm in terms of things you might be thinking about. Uh, but there are things that take up a lot of my time and my interest right now, and they have an awful lot to do with entrepreneurship and, and to essentially technology because much of technology grows out of entrepreneurship. Um, I, I've had the opportunity to serve as the chairman of the American Enterprise Institute. Most of you won't know what that is. Uh, it's not a very descriptive name um, uh, other than it's a conservative think tank in Washington, D.C. And we uh, spend most of our time... Um, trying to preserve the principles of uh, freedom in our country. And the, uh, our current CEO is a fellow by the name of Arthur Brooks. Uh, Dean Cornyn knows him, knows him well, uh, a scholar in his own right uh, from Syracuse University. And Arthur originally, uh, when I first met him, had written a book called Gross National Happiness. I've talked about it before at various settings. And th in the book, he was trying to uh, determine and explain the sources of happiness in life. And um, he was doing it from an academic standpoint. And so as you can imagine with, uh, with we as Latter-day Saints, how we might think about happiness and, uh, and its implications for life. Uh, and he was trying to quantify exactly what it was from an academic and an analytic standpoint. Um, and so he looked at various demographic segments in the United States uh, and trends in happiness and behaviors from 1972 uh, until uh, 2006 when he wrote this book. Um, and his foreword states that he was trying to determine uh, if people in America were actually a happy people. And the, the reason for that is that the Declaration of Independence, as you know, says that we are here and that we have inalienable rights surrounding life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And so he's interested if, if that's really happening, and if it is, who's pursuing the happiness and who's catching it? Uh, when they pursue it. Um, now you might imagine or know that those, those famous words Thomas Jefferson penned in the Declaration of Independence were not uh, the original draft of that concept. Uh, a man by the name of George Mason wrote the Virginia Declaration of um, Rights and it contained passages that were very similar to the, uh, to the uh, um, Declaration of Independence. But in, in his version, he talked a lot more about um, pursuing um, and possessing property versus pursuing happiness. Now, the emphasis on property uh, that George Mason used came from a great Scottish uh, philosopher uh, by the name of John Locke, many of you will know who that is, who believed that all men had the natural right to acquire, uh, to protect, to dispose of the property. And so Thomas Jefferson decided that rather than uh, use property, even though that was the lineage of how these documents had been written, that he would add in the pursuit of happiness instead. He may not have known for sure why he did that, um, but this shift away from material goods and property towards the pursuit of happiness was really a shift in our country uh, from materialism to morality. And that, that is a big, big difference. Um, America was intended to be the greatest experiment of liberty that the world had ever seen. Property was the what of that experiment, and the pursuit of happiness was the why. And when Thomas Jefferson was asked years later, why did you change it, and why did you put the pursuit of happiness there, he said that it was an expression of the American mind, which is very kind of typical Thomas Jeffersonian uh, response. But in truth, it really is an expression of the American heart and how we all feel. Um, the founders did not promise happiness, only its pursuit, uh, leaving it to each one of us to define happiness as the way we see fit and matching our skills with our passions. Uh, and the moral promise to the nation and to its people was that they would have the opportunity to pursue whatever they wanted and have that self-realization and thereby achieve their individual happiness. Now, Dr. Brooks suggests um, that the answer to whether we as American people are happy or not 
uh, is really uh, jury still out? So it's, it's a yes and it's no. Well, why would that be the case? Well, it's not happiness in America is not evenly distributed. Uh, some folks are doing more than their part for national happiness. Uh, research has been devoted to asking whether certain dem demographic groups are happier than others, and the results are interesting. For example, older people are slightly likelier than younger people to say that they're very happy. But they also have a propensity to say that they're very unhappy. <laughs> so it kind of skews. Uh, whites and black African Americans have a similar probability of saying that they're very happy. But African Americans are 50% likelier to say that they're unhappy. Women are slightly happier than men. Women, you probably already knew that on average. But in general, these demographic differences are far less important to reported happiness than the differences in attitudes, behaviors, and lifestyle. And you'd be interested to note that average happiness levels in America have stayed largely constant over this last 40 year period. Ways American people have remained actually fairly happy, but uh, consistently happy. So what is it that differentiates a happy people from, uh, from one that's less, a group of people that's less happy? Well, Dr. Brooks says that happiness is a political subject. And that while he doesn't advocate any political position, um, he took a look at the political spectrum to find out if there were any differences in happiness. And he found some. In 2004, People who said they were conservative, or very conservative, were nearly twice as likely to say that they were happy as people who call themselves liberal or very liberal. Conservatives were only half as likely to say that they were not too happy, uh, 19 versus 9 percent. Political conservatives were also far less likely than liberals to express maladjustment to their adult lives. For example, <coughs> Adults on the political right were only half as likely as those on the left to say, at times, I think I'm no good at all. They were also less likely to say they were dissatisfied with themselves or were inclined to feel like they were failures or be very pessimistic about their future. Further, in a 2007 survey, 58% of Republicans rated their mental health as excellent. I guess if you self-rate, you are. Um, versus 43 percent of political independents versus 38 percent of Democrats. And this gap in that happiness scale has existed for about 35 years. Now, unless you think I'm trying to promote a political party here, which I, I've probably got uh, a few folks who are, who are uh, thinking that, um, I'm really not. These are, these are a, a look at various demographic groups. And, and what I'm really here to share with you is, is to understand what drives that happiness gap, rather than who's happy and who's not. And there was a gap of about 20 points from the worst to the best. And Dr. Brooks spent his time trying to figure out what, what was it that drove that 20 points. Well, you won't be surprised to know that the first different factor was faith, faith or religion, or level of activity in one's religion. Now, in the polling, uh, um, a profession, it's called religiosity, if you ever hear the, this term, versus secularization. And in 2004, 46% of conservatives attended church weekly versus 16% of American liberals. And those believers, or those the ones who attended church or had high religiosity, believed in a God that was loving, uncontrolling, and they tended to be happier than those who saw God as unloving and more controlling. So first is faith. Second was marital status, which you may or may not know. I know we may have some single people in the room, but I apologize to you, but you're, you're just not as happy as the rest of us. So, um, Married people from all political groups were nearly twice as likely as singles to say that they were very happy. And since two-thirds of conservatives tend to be married versus one-third for non-conservatives, that would explain part of the difference. The last belief uh, was a belief, or the last factor, was a belief in the individual and that individual's ability to optimistically think of the future and control their future or their success. At least they believed they did. They felt they did. And so that made that group uh, a, lot, uh, a lot happier. Now that was different than uh, for conservatives than it was for liberals. Liberals felt that um, uh, you could not rely on yourself to be successful, that you needed government or somebody else to help make you happy. 
Um, um, and George Will put it uh, that conservatives felt that happiness was a project rather than an entitlement. Uh, and so they believed in the power of the individual, conservatives did, versus liberals believing in the power of the collective to help and, or to victimize. So you've got these three factors. Now, today I, I'm not going to go into any detail on those three, but I do want to talk about the last one because it has a lot to, I think, a lot of great bearing for all of you and all of those of you who you might inspire who are budding entrepreneurs and have a belief that they can actually do something and change the world and can be responsible uh, for that. And in so doing, we'll find great happiness. It doesn't always turn into great success, by the way, as many of us know, who have failed in you know, many uh, attempts at, uh, at entrepreneurism. But it does and definitely buys happiness. So just lastly, in, in Mormon terms, what, this is, shouldn't be very surprising, because we all know that an act of faith and a loving father in heaven, a successful marriage, and optimism, responsibility associated with free agency, having control over our life to do as we determine, is a great portion of what brings happiness into our lives today. And we all know that kind of naturally, but I just want you to know that the, the analytic studies and the academic studies bear that out. Um, so the entrepreneur asks the question, well, you know, can I, can I just have control of what I want to do and take a shot at what I believe can be done? I'll work myself to a frazzle to get it done. I'll kill myself. I will do whatever I need to do in order to get that done because I believe in that vision as an entrepreneur. Uh, and that's, that's what we ask for, right, as, as entrepreneur, entrepreneurs? It doesn't say that we'll always succeed, and there's not very many promises. It just gives us the opportunity to try and make the attempt. Well, today we hear and we see that the free enterprise system of entrepreneurship is really under siege. Small businesses are struggling to start and to grow due to capital shortage, looming taxation, and the increased cost of regulation. Uh, normally, as you would see, coming out of a recession, as we have throughout the last 50 years, or out of a tough economic time, you see a, a, a expanse and grow of uh, entrepreneurial pursuits. So normally as employment drops during those downtime, those who are displaced through that period uh, or unable to find work seek to start their own businesses. They start repair shops. They start landscaping businesses. They look at new uh, useful websites as a startup or social media sites and they spring up by the hundreds in a normal cycle. For all of those who might be outside the protection or choose not to be inside the protection of a large corporation or of the government, and that's how the free market works. But this time, the populace, and we are being told that the market is rigged against us and that the government must defend us against the tyranny of the free market and of tyranny of entrepreneurial capitalism, that the, the market favors only the rich and the crony capitalists. And the notion that the 1% is making out fine, although, as you might imagine, I've never been able to figure out you know, which side you're on, because you start out as a 99er, and then you become a 1%, you're really happy. But you were 99% for most of your life. <laughs> and so is Bill Gates, is he a 99%er or a 1%er? Well, he started out as a 99 for a long time, but, uh, and, and, and most of you have as well. But when you become a 1%er, you don't necessarily think of yourself as that. Think of yourself as a, as a 99er. Um, but this time, as we've come out of a, or trying to come out of a recession, which is, is stalled, the definition of opportunity and fairness, which is usually the case, as I've described uh, through our founding fathers, has been questioned. And the notion of entrepreneurism is in the process of being redefined. And there are two competing definitions of fairness that you might have heard about, and I just make you aware of them. Um, the one is called redistributive fairness, which says it is fair to equalize rewards and that inequality is inherently unfair. And that's got traction. The second notion of fairness is called meritocratic fairness, which says that fairness means matching reward to merit and that forced equality is inherently unfair. And you've got these two notions uh, being actively debated by very intelligent and very capable people. Well, what does this have to do with the, uh, 
Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology. Uh, first, let me discuss the notion of entrepreneurial motivation uh, that we all supposedly have or have had. While many pink people think that money is the key motivation and the source of happiness, uh, Dr. Brooks' research uncovered that wealth and income has increased over the last 50 years dramatically, but happiness has stayed pretty much the same. So during that period of time, there's been a lot more wealth created, but there hasn't been any happiness, net increase in happiness. Now, most of us here buy that on face value, so I don't think I need to discuss more about that, but you'll be interested to know that entrepreneurs of all type rate their well-being higher than any other professional group in America, uh, according to years and years of polling by the Gallup organization. Why are they so happy? Why are you all so happy? Now, you may not feel like you're happy right now, but you're a lot happier than, than others are. Well, it's not because you're making more money, uh, because, because you're not. Um, according to the employment website, careerbuilder.com, in 2011, small business owners actually made 19% less money per year than government managers. Nor are entrepreneurs happier because they work less hours. Now, that I don't think I have to talk to you about, because I think you'll buy that right, right without me even saying more. But, but it's substantial. The statistics are substantial on that. So entrepreneurs work more. They make less money. Um, but they're happier. So what's the secret? Dr. Brooks has found that money itself brings little, little joy to life, as we've talked about, but that the free enterprise system brings what all people truly crave, earned success. That's what he believes the founders meant by the pursuit of happiness, the ability to pursue it and to earn it, and by earning it, finding great rewards. To earn your success is to define and pursue your happiness as you see fit. It's the freedom to be an individual and to delineate your life's profit however you want. And for some, this profit is measured in money. But for many, profit is measured in making beautiful art, saving people's souls, pulling kids out of poverty, or developing the next new technology. Now, the founders knew that the role of a moral government was to create the condition of liberty and opportunity so that each one of us could define success as we saw fit. Their visionary insight was that to allow a nation's people the opportunity to earn their success was precisely what would give each citizen the chance at achieving real happiness. In a 2001 survey conducted by the researchers at Ohio State University, they found that people who said they did not feel responsible for their own success spent about 25% more time feeling sad than those who felt they were responsible. Joseph Schumpeter, often called the godfather of modern entrepreneurism and a, and a great economist, said of entrepreneurs, the financial result is a secondary consideration. It is, however, an index of success and a symptom of victory. Now think about your own life. Think about the jobs you've enjoyed and the jobs you have not. Have you ever quit a job because, no matter how hard you worked or how clever you were, your material rewards had stalled? Consider this. 70% of people who say their chances for promotion are good are very satisfied with their jobs versus 42% who say their chances for promotion are not good. To be happy, we as a people need to have a clear uh, path to success and have the ability to measure and keep our rewards. Now, earned success, which is uh, tied very closely to happiness, has an evil flip side. That flip side is called learned helplessness. Now, this term was coined by the social psychologist Martin Seligman of the University of Pennsylvania. Learned helplessness is a state in which if reward and punishment are not tied to merit, people simply give up and they stop trying to succeed. Just as earned success brings happiness, learned helplessness brings unhappiness. As Seligman noted in an interview in the New York Times, we found that even when good things occurred that weren't earned, like nickels coming out of slot machines, it did not increase people's well-being. It produced helplessness. People simply gave up and became passive. Now, the implications for a welfare state are obvi 
quite obvious. Uh, here we don't need to talk a lot about that. And if ever a government gives uh, folks rewards that they don't earn, uh, it will not improve their well-being. Even worse, it can make them helpless. Now, I'm not talking about the truly indigent, those people who are really struggling or have difficulties, um, disabled or very incapable. We will always need a safety net for those people. But the message is clear. People thrive when they can earn their success and they suffer under conditions when they can't or are they trained not to succeed. For the majority of people, the most common source of earned success is work. And I think you know that. Philosopher Eric Fromm wrote that only in being productive actively can man make sense of his life. But to be productively active is not enough. Slaves are productively active. To earn their success, people have to be more than productive. They must also choose their own paths and have a chance of finding the work that matches their passions with their talent. That match is what Albert Camus called the soul in work. Without work, all life goes rotten. But when work is soulless, life stifles and dies. Now in Dr. Brooks' most recent work, called The Road to Freedom, he says the following. Have you ever heard the old expression that Americans live to work and that Europeans work to live? Americans work 50% more than the Italians, France, or even the Germans. Why? Some argue that it's because Americans are terrified of losing their jobs. Others claim it's due to a quasi-religious work ethic that we have here in America. According to Time magazine, in the puritanical version of Christianity that has always appealed to Americans, religion comes packaged with the stern message that hard work is good for the soul. Modern Europe has avoided so melancholy a lesson. And not surprisingly, working makes Americans much more happy than it makes Europeans. Now, when one describes earned success, perhaps it seems we're only talking about the good things of life. After all, flourishing and happiness don't come from pain or suffering, right? Wrong. Earned success requires sacrifice. And a system that dedicates itself to expunging the challenges and the risk in people's life is fundamentally immoral. Whenever you ask entrepreneurs, and you can ask yourself or someone at your table, about their successes, they spend a great deal of time describing the hardships, early failures, bankruptcies, missed little league games, endless nights without sleep. They talk about almost losing their homes and the strain that the work put on their marriages. Bernie Marcus, the founder of Home Depot, the $60 billion home improvement chain, recalls the sacrifices entrepreneurs often encounter on the path to prosperity. For him, he said, sacrifices were central to his latter earned success. Failure, anxi uh, failure, anxiety, and the lean years were just necessary evils that were lessons to learn and tests to pass. They were the earned part of earned success, and there was no substitute for them. Now, when we hear about successful entrepreneurs, it's almost as if they had the Midas touch because we like to hear about the successes. But in real life, that's not how it works. Stephen Rogers in the Entrepreneur's Guide to Finance and Business reports that the average entrepreneur fails 3.8 times before succeeding. According to CareerBuilder.com, the average small business owner earns 44,576 per year in personal income, hardly a fortune. But it was Alex, Alexis de Tocqueville who, when visiting America and marveling, said, what most astonishes me in the United States is not so much the marvelous grandeur of some of the undertakings, but of the innumerable multitude of small ones. He just saw lots of people developing entrepreneurships and pursuing their interests. Now, no one, and I, I can speak for myself at least, and I'm sure I am speak for you, is all that eager to sa sacrifice that much. Um, it's very hard. And those sacrifices look good when they're in the rearview mirror, but they're not very, they're not very fun when we're, uh, when we're confronting them. But if people are given away out of every crisis and every challenge, they become less likely to succeed in the long term and less likely to enjoy the success they acquire because it becomes unearned. Now, bailouts do more than provide a, bailouts that, that do more than just provide a standard of living, whether it's a mortgage relief or a billion dollar bailout, teach the wrong lessons and lead people to learn helplessness. 
Now, earned success, not materialism or government redistribution, is the way to understand the founders' moral promise of the pursuit of happiness in America today. Let's conclude now by revisiting these two definitions of fairness that I presented earlier within the context of earned success and morality. Remember, one definition was that, that of redistributive fairness, or that inequality is unfair. And the other is meritocratic fairness, suggesting that merit should be matched to performance and that forced equality is unfair. De Tocqueville wrote that Americans are contemptuous of the theory of a permanent equality of wealth. Thomas Jefferson put it this way, to take from one because it is thought his own industry and that of his father's has acquired too much in order to share with others who or whose father may have exercised equal industry and skill is to violate arbitrarily the first principles of association to guarantee to everyone the free exercise of his industry and the fruits acquired by it. And these views follow really an ancient truth that we all buy into, I believe, that to take resources from those who legitimately earn them and give them to another who does not is not fair. If it's voluntary, it's called charity and it's charitable. If it is coerced, it's unfair. Now, opinion polls in America are uniform in, the, in support of merit over redistribution. But the question that arises is one of opportunity. Are we still in the United States an opportunity society? And can everyone partake of the blessings of our nation? One way to look at this is to look at whether or not people can still get ahead economically in the United States. University of Michigan Flint economist Mark Perry has analyzed data from the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis to see whether Americans are mobile between income classes. He asked the question, if you're poor in America, does this mean you stay poor? And if you're rich, are you set for life? The answer to both questions was a resounding no. The poor can and do rise in America, and according to Perry's research, the rich can and do fall. He shows that 44% of households in the bottom quintile, the lowest 20% of earners, in 2001, had moved to a higher quintile by 2007. And during that same period, 34% of those in the highest quintile had moved to the lower. So there was definite movement. Now, not everybody rises from poverty. Millions and millions, however, do. But the data simply do not support the idea that the deck is hopelessly stacked against us. Given the fact, given the facts, it's hard, hardly a surprise to find that a huge majority of Americans believe the U.S. is still an opportunity society. Now, had our ancestors not believed this, connection between hard work and success and opportunity, most of us wouldn't be here today. And if you're a descendant from immigrants, as most of us are at some point not very far back, you ask yourself, why did our ancestors come here? And I'm confident they didn't come to America in search of a stronger system of government income redistribution. A system without opportunity where merit was not rewarded was why they were escaping from Europe in the first place. So it's no surprise then that polls find that Americans believe uh, the estate tax to be the most unfair tax in our entire tax system. It offends our sense of meritocratic fairness, not due to any merit on the part of our heirs, but because people who honestly earn their money should not have it confiscated and redistributed after they die. Now, America doesn't have the perfect society. We don't have even the perfect opportunity society. But if we want to move closer to that ideal, we must define fairness as meritocratic. That system which makes all this possible is, of course, the entrepreneurial free enterprise system in America. And the Center for Entrepreneurism and Technology supports and advocates for this system. And you're all here because of it. I watch and look for those success stories, small and large, coming out of the center. Of the free enterprise system developing within students, faculty, here at BYU and across America. I am proud of the work being done by the center and applaud all of those of you who are doing it. Let me just conclude with a poem. And it's called The Tame Duck. It was published in 1929 in a newsletter from the Milwaukee Cooperative Milk Producers. And it describes in an amusing way the lives we face if we turn our back 
on the free enterprise system and entrepreneurism in America. There are two tame ducks in our backyard, dabbling in the mud, trying hard to get their share and maybe more of the overflowing barnyard store. They're fairly content with the task they're at of eating and sleeping and getting fat, but whenever the free wild duck go by in a long line streaming down the sky, they cock a quizzical, puzzled eye and flap their wings and they try to fly. I think my soul is a tame old duck dabbling around in the barnyard muck, fat and lazy with useless wings, but at times when the north wind sings and the wild ones hurtle overhead, if something uh, it remembers something lost and dead, and cocks a wary, bewildered eye, and makes a feeble attempt to fly. It's fairly content with the state it's in, but it isn't the duck it might have been. Well, I'm a product of BYU, and I'm a product of the entrepreneurial system and the benefits that it allows each one of us to earn by choosing our own destiny. Uh, I'm proud of BYU for that, and I'm proud of that system of America. And and I thank our Heavenly Father for inspiring the founders and for allowing economic freedom to exist in this country uh, for each of us here. Many of you who have been very, very successful. Some of those of you who maybe have not achieved all that success you want yet in life. But for having the right and the opportunity to make that attempt and for BYU and helping us uh, provide the background and the, the knowledge we need to do so, I'm very pleased. And I leave you that message in Jesus' name. Amen.